Hello, dear viewers, and welcome back to the channel. I'm your host, Mavery, where today we are going to be continuing our watch of Steins Gate Episode 5. So, last episode, uh, Rintaro and company finally got their hands on an old IBN 5100, right? Apparently, this is going to be used to open one of the legacy programs or read the legacy code that is apparently being used by CERN, uh, and so they can maybe open up the story a little bit more and we have a better understanding of where the story is actually going. Right? Although, judging from last episode's preview, probably they're gonna have to fix up this computer first. And that's what I presume will be happening within this episode. Uh, if we were to use a video game analogy, this is part of the fetch quest, right? Since this was an adaption from a game. But, in any case, I don't think there's really much else to talk about right here, so let's just see what happens in this episode. So let's begin in 3, 2, 1, play. It's this girl, who I also have a sneaking suspicion knows a lot more than she lets on. Maybe she's from the future, or another timeline or something. Yeah, see, she knows what it is. So maybe, like I said, maybe she comes from the future, maybe Kurisu did something to betray Rintaro in the future, something like that. Hmm. Wait, it hurts you to shut up this one instance. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> oh, they're going to Akihabara. <laughs> 
That's hot. <laughs> Or if the shower room? Don't tell me she's John Titer or related to something. Yet. Right? Yet. Yeah, I'm pretty sure she's from the future. Alright, why are you here? <笑>せっかくね、<笑> This dude, I love him. <laughs> oh, he's taking it apart? Really?
<laughs> what? <laughs> Why are you going along with him? <laughs> Uh, I have no words. I like how these two are playing over here. And Itaru is working his ass off over there. <laughs> what is this? I'll bet this is an actual board game, isn't it? You're not very convincing when you call some. Don't you do have anything better to do? Wait. Okay, so he hooked it up to his own. JPEG? 
ていなかったが、それは21世紀の男が処分を犯罪意識になれば、ただの誤解だ。OK。Iron Lifter? Iron Truster? Human Experiments? <laughs> I do hope you guys are using some oh, okay that answers the question like, you better be behind some proxies and whatnot. Huh. I definitely didn't think that they would start this just now. James McCarthy? Wait, they're just throwing a man into a black hole? <laughs> This match of what? Hmm. And they're appearing all over the place, so... Apparently they haven't... They haven't figured out how to... 
you know, keep them in place. Right. Because when you go back in, you know, time... As I was saying, um, since, you know, we are on a moving planet, when you go back in time, uh, it's not, like, the place that you are right now isn't going to be the time, you know, the place that it was in space 40 years ago, right? But the thing is, they're still on Earth, though. They haven't just disappeared into space or something. So, they still have some kind of control over it. Okay. Oh. So they are going to start building it? Alright. This is getting fun. Alrighty, so this was a pretty fun episode, especially when they talked about a lot of the science pro uh the science topics and you know actually this part this area of science is a big fascination to me as well as a sort of passing interest so i like to talk a little bit about the what you know what kind of science that this show is currently based on especially in regards to the black holes time travel and whatnot right so first of all let's talk about the uh the usage of the black holes here right they are talking specifically about Kerr black holes now what exactly is that and how does that pertain you know how does that differ from normal black holes well first of all uh to put it simply there are four types of math mathematically viable black holes uh that we know of and mathematically viable here means that they pertain to einstein's general theory of relativity so there's four valid types of black holes now out of these i guess um the one that we are probably most familiar with um uh, growing of maybe from school or whatnot is the simplest and earliest um, formulated one called the Schwarzschild black hole which is like I said it's the most simplistic one because it was the first one that originated out of you know it was the first um, mathematically viable solution and basically it, it goes with you know our general understanding of a black hole right it's infinite mass you know it's it's a black hole in space uh where gravity is so strong that everything falls into it and once it reaches the the um the very center point what which we call a singularity you know things are basically crushed down by all the by the immense gravity into uh infinite mass if you will um so it, it's like you know you're sucked in and then you're compressed together and and that's the end of that right now that is how we generally learn about black holes growing up now the thing is though that uh theoretically conceptually uh according to what we know currently about the universe in general um this type of black hole the source star black hole cannot actually exist or sorry it, it can exist but it shouldn't exist naturally what should exist so that also that pertains to three of the four viable solutions they are basically just uh sort of thought experiments if you will they're mathematically viable but that doesn't mean that they naturally occur um in the universe now what does occur in the universe however is the concept of a Kerr black hole so this one is you know more commonly known as a rotating black hole um it's also the one it's also the black hole that we actually gained direct observation of uh earlier this year now if you guys know about the event horizon telescope project and whatnot um they well, they they observed this black hole earlier, like like one or two years prior. But in April of this year, they did uh, come out with the full data, the press conference and whatnot, and they revealed to the public what a 
black hole actually looks like. And the black hole that they show is a curved black hole, which matches what we um, know so far that should occur in nature. Right. Uh, so we've already got that evidence. And another in, another uh, fun fact, I guess, you, if you will, <laughs> since this I'm looking at this series in 2019, you know, we have had some other media in between where we can also further our understanding of this. Uh, one of the best examples I can bring up is one of my favorite movies, and that is Interstellar. Right, so I don't know how many of you guys have seen this before. Uh, if you haven't, then I guess, spoiler alert, I'm not going to talk too much about it. But anyways, in that movie, there is also a black hole. And that is also basically a curved black hole, a rotating black hole. Um, and, you know, the entire con the, the funny thing about a curved black hole is that mathematically, as we understand it, you don't nec you aren't necessarily, you know, uh, pulled into the black hole and then you can never escape and you know, you're crushed to infinite mass, right? Uh, mathematically speaking, what can perhaps happen is that you are able to transverse between different universes whilst you are in the uh, in a curved black hole. Now, I'm not going to get into the specifics, but it's just one of the um, physical properties of this black hole, if you will. Uh, now, whether or not that is actually possible, that's another story, but mathematically, that's something that's uh, that can potentially happen. Uh, you can transverse between different universes. And this ties in directly with the multi-world interpretation of quantum mechanics, right? So we already... so. You know, by, by saying that you can go to different universes, you're also assuming that there are these infinite universes already there that allows you to travel to them. So that is one possible outcome of escaping a curved black hole. The other outcome is that um, if you do some other assumption in regards to the shape of a universe, uh, you can also view a curved black hole as having a wormhole, if you will. And that is you're able to transverse through a a hole and transverse through space and time. So here we can also say that this uh, in essence can turn into a time machine. It allows you to travel backwards and forwards through time. And now if you use the other interpretation which is you can travel to another universe, well like I said uh, you can travel to universe and potentially to different timelines as well. So this actually is rooted in science. Of course this is unproven science but um, it is all mathematically and technically possible, right? So I did find that part very interesting uh, in regards to this. And if nothing else, it gives me uh, an excuse to brush up on my scientific um, knowledge as well. So that, I feel like, is a plus for me from this episode. So, uh, that was the black holes, that was very, definitely very interesting. Uh, it also talks about, all right, it also, uh, back to the, comp the computer part, right, which I spent a lot of last episode uh, talking about. So, they didn't really, you know, go through too much of, the, of what they actually did in regards to that. So, that was a little bit disappointing to me, but... Um, but anyways, we, we got the black hole and stuff, so that that's already uh, taken care of. But um, I think one thing that I failed to note from last episode is that CERN actually doesn't just uh, <laughs> isn't just actually describing the the laboratory and the you know and the LHC, the Large Hadron Collider, and you know all these other particle accelerators and whatnot. It actually also you know <laughs> uh, describes the organization that was founded in the 50s, right? So um, I made one kind of error uh, in regards to last episode where I said, you know, it. I don't feel like they would be using legacy programs because, you know, they have these shiny new facilities, right? Well, uh, if you think about it, since they are doing research since the 50s, uh, it would make total sense that they would also commission, uh, you know, IBM and, you know, potentially other manufacturers to create programs that are able to help them in their research, right? That's something that does happen in the real world as well. Um, so it is entirely possible that a, you know, a research institution, a research organization would ask some, some computer manufacturers uh, to write some software specifically for them to run their simulations and experiments. So uh, that part I do have to make a correction on. 
Um, so that pretty much covers the science that, that we know of for these two, these two episodes. Um, some remaining questions that I do have. One is in regards to Suzu, right? The part-timer girl. So, again, I, since last episode, I was pretty much convinced that she probably came from the future and whatnot. Um, and this episode further reinforces my belief about this, especially with her attitude towards Kirisu. Um, and, you know, just judging by that reaction, I'm gonna say that Kirisu maybe did something in the future that had a huge impact on... I know, maybe her close pack of friends, if you can call them that, or maybe on humanity in general, right? So that is definitely something to look upon, but I'm like 99% convinced right now that Suzu is from the future, or at least an alternate timeline or alternate world. So there's that part. Um, the second part is, I guess, more of a small thing, but I've been noticing that that llama, or whatever the heck that creature is on TV, has been appearing an awful lot. And in fact, it's getting kind of creepy now. So, I don't know. I feel like something's fishy about that that creature or thing of a jig or whatever. So, it, I could be completely wrong, but I feel like the camera panned to that creature one too many times. So, I don't know. Um, that thing is looking more and more suspicious by the minute. And thirdly, um, I guess I should have talked about this last episode in regards to John Titer. Uh, and that is, you know, how exactly is him coming back to the past going to change anything, right? Now, uh, I guess that's that's not the right way to word it. Of course it changes everything, but the thing is, it doesn't really help his future, right? It doesn't help the other future. If you go back in time and, you know, either if you want to use the, the multi-world interpretation or you want to use the... Uh, the Back to the Future interpretation or whatnot, or the different interpretations. Once you go back to the past and you change something, that already branches out into an entirely different timeline. So when you go back to the past, you change something, and then you go to the future, that is not going to be your original future, right? And probably in that future, in the new future that you're going to, uh, those people wouldn't even know you, right? So you're not, so say for instance, you um, I don't know, your loved one was killed in your original future and you wanted to go back to the past and change that. Well, once you change that and then you go back to the future from that point, uh, your loved one probably won't even know you anymore, right? So that's what I'm getting at. So I'm not really sure how this, um, <laughs> you know, I feel like this is maybe a, a bug in the, um, in the story, right? A plot hole or something, but... You know, I'll, I'll refrain from saying that right now because maybe the story explains itself in the future. Like I said, if it does utilize more of a closed loop system, uh, they probably are able to avoid that pitfall as well. But, you know, a closed loop system doesn't really pertain with the multi universe, multi world interpretation. Yeah, I don't know. Let's, let's just see what's going to happen, right? So. That, I think, covers everything I want to talk about uh, for this episode. Um, for the next episode, yeah, I think I'm going to have to stop right here. So, anyways, I will see you guys in the next episode, probably on Friday. So, until then, stay tuned, and bye-bye.